Randolph is an associate professor at UT. Um, she is also a consultant. She is also a dear friend of mine. Um, and she kind of ruined it because I was going to basically out her in terms of all of the things that make Karen sort of quirky and fun. She's into assemblage. She does stuff with found objects. She is part of an FYA book club. She is an awesome, wonderful advocate for pop culture. And she put it all on her bio and it's on the website. So you probably already read that. <laughs> so, so much for ethos. Um, so what I will say about her is the thing that she would not say about herself, which is that she is one of the kindest, most generous, most connecting people you will ever meet. Um, she is the person who puts up her hand when you're in crisis and says, I will be there. And love her to death. It's such an honor to be here. I was telling some of my friends this is a little bit outside of my comfort zone because you didn't sign up for a college class and you're not you know, expecting a behavioral ethics lecture, but that's what I do um, and what I enjoy doing. Um, I'm also a certified strength coach and I really um, love helping people um, sort of uh, find their passion through their talents. Um, this is something I use to introduce myself to my students every semester. It's a little mix of like, like professional um, and personal. And um, my wife made a huge effort to be here today. She's in healthcare and she never gets time off. And I'm just really grateful to you. So thank you um, for coming. Um, uh, and if you want to know, my students are always like, do you know about that meme? I'm like, yeah, I, I know about that meme. Um, so I am Karen and you will never name your children that. It might take a few generations down the line. Um, uh, one of my goals in life is to never embody what that meme represents, but unfortunately my name has some baggage. Um, and it's it's so weird because I was always the only Karen that I knew. I don't know how I that, that name became like the Gen X example of, of everything evil um, <laughs> in the world. But there you go. Um, so ethos, right? That is what we're here to talk about. Uh, and when Ben, um, you know, we, we miss Ben today. I know he's um, having some uh, family uh, emergencies. So, um, you know, we wishing his family health and, um, and peace. Uh, but when Ben, uh, he gave me a list of topics and it was like 15 words. And he said, you know, which word speaks to you? Um, and initially justice was a word and that was like three years ago. And I was like, that's a great word, I'm a lawyer. Um, but then uh, they were like, no, we're going in another direction with that. So I got bumped. Um, and then I got to choose another word and ethos sort of uh, jumped off at me because I, I teach behavioral ethics. Um, I teach lots of things, but one of the things I teach is ethics. And I always do think a lot about um, what are your values? What, um, what is it that drives you? Um, what you know gets you going? Um, and there's lots of different definitions for, for ethos. And um, it's a whole approach to um, helping people um, be persuasive. Um, it's a, a three-part argument. You want to do ethos, logos, and pathos, um, and uh, you know, passion and logic um, are all very important. Um, but uh, for me, from my perspective, um, your values um, and the way that you um, view the world is what I spend most of my time talking to my students about, um, coaching clients about, is, is helping people just um, understand the importance um, of having a a perspective, um, knowing what your values are and how um, you want to show up in the world is incredibly important because everything about the way that we behave and the decisions that we make is incredibly situational. Um, and so, you know, you can be a good person at heart, um, but situations can change you. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, what is your ethos is something that I do think a lot about. How do you define the world? How do you think about your place in the world? And here at Creative Mornings, I really 
really love um, the, the manifesto, Everyone is Creative, because when Anne um, you know, first invited me to come, I was like, oh, you know, I'm not, I don't really, I'm not a creative person. I never really thought of myself that way. This was kind of before I got this crazy habit that I now have. Um, but, um, but when I now think about, you know, I do think of myself as a creative problem solver. I try to be a creative educator. Um, and I also like to glue tiny objects to shit. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, so, um, so my sort of creative ethos is everything in the world that I think is fun and throw it on things um, and make them stick. Uh, so I just make these found object. A friend of mine told me it's not collage, it's assemblage. That sounds pretentious to me, so I still call it collage, but I suppose the technical term is assemblage. This was the first one that I made we, when we bought our house. I thought, you know, we need to have something to brighten it up. And I love dogs, um, and I found I love to go sidewalk shopping, you know, when, you, when there's like that bulk pickup time. I love to kind of drive around and see if there are things I can glue little tiny objects to. Um, and so, dog house. Um, and then, uh, during the pandemic, uh, people couldn't really go anywhere, but they walked, and there were lots of wonderful children in my neighborhood. These are my neighbors. That's Cleo. She's awesome. Um, and I was like, you know, all these kids are walking with their parents, and they don't really have anything to do. And so I thought, maybe I could give them some games to play when they're walking around. So then I created the these, uh, I don't even know what to call them, um, games, toys games. It's sort of like Where's Waldo and, um, you know, what's different, <laughs> spot the different thing. And anyway, so I made these uh, and people would come from all over the neighborhood and uh, and stop and play the games. And, and I had a little toy box and people would, the kids would take toys. And it was just a fun thing um, to do during the pandemic. And it kind of ties together a lot of things. Um, that I like, and you know, I'm a terrible photographer, so I don't think I've really, I don't know how you not make the mirror appear in the photo, but um, I, all of these wonderful photographers that were here could, could really teach me something, but I just wanted to give an example. Um, the one on the left I made for my wife, who is, I'm a maximalist, she's a minimalist, so being married to me is a big challenge. Um, I insisted she needed something for her work, and she said, you can keep it in your office. Um, so, so, so I made this for her, but it's in my office. Um, but it represents her, uh, the things that, and then this one on the right is all the things that I love in tiny detail. So I'm a maximalist who's like also a maniac, I guess. I like really small things. Um, so, you know, what is it, like, how do you create, what, how do you think about the way that you are creative? Um, and when I think about sort of my mission, I guess, uh, it's on my LinkedIn profile. Anne said, I don't really hide these things. Um, so even, you know, I, I'm an associate professor of instruction, and I actually just got promoted, and so it's a really big deal that I'm not an assistant. I'm now an associate. You get promoted. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I'm... You know, I always used to say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just a lecturer. I'm not a researcher. I'm not tenure track. But they still make you go through the whole process. And it takes eight years to move from one position to the other. So, you know, it still feels like I went up for tenure, um, even though I don't get it. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, I do think about, uh, you know, empowering people and, um, and helping people to sort of find what, what drives them, um, what gives them energy, what makes them tick. Um, and and, and how do I do that for myself? I, I, I don't have like a prescription for other people. I always ask, you know, what is your goals? I, one of the things I, uh, when I used to be a director of career services on the, on, at UT before I started teaching full time, and, and I would say, you know, I help people find meaningful work and they define what meaningful is for them, right? I worked at the business school. The MBAs had a little different definition of meaningful work than I did, um, but that wasn't mine to put, right? Mine was just to help. Um, and then when I, uh, I took over in natural sciences, they had a different definition. I liked theirs a little better than the MBAs, but you know, I'm, it's not my place to judge. Um, but uh, 
you know, how I get there for myself. Um, and one thing, I, I do give my students assignments, so I actually make them do these things because I'm allowed to. Um, but I ask them, you know, what are your values, right? It's one of the very first things we start with because if you're going to make ethical decisions, um, you have to be clear in what your values are because as I said, everything is situational. Um, somebody in the morning could make a really good ethical choice, and in the afternoon, um, somebody could have sm uh, sprayed some fart spray in the room, and they're running late um, for the thing that they need to go to, so there's bad smells, and there's time pressure, and they do something that is out of character, but very situational, right? So a good person can do a very good thing and a very bad thing in the same day, in the same hour. Um, but the only hope we have for sticking to our like best selves, um, the, that behavioral um, approach to ethical decision making is being clear on our values, um, understanding sort of what makes us um, good at what we do, what gives us power, what gives us uh, energy and faith in our abilities um, and, and being clear on that. Um, and you have to have a decision-making model. Um, my students, I, uh, we always start every day with an ethical dilemma and they always tell me what they think and they always have a reaction. And I'm, just like, I'm like, but remember, every situation is different. So what you think this morning could change in two hours and it doesn't matter what you thought this morning, it matters what you do in the moment, right? So I'm not a theorist, I don't care about theory. Most of you are probably, if you like um, theory and, uh, and uh, ethics, you've probably read more um, philosophers than I have. I don't read philosophy. Um, behavioralists care about the actions um, that people make. And I'm a lawyer by training. I specialize in intellectual property law. So uh, it, it's not at all in my background to think about theory, but I do care about process. Um, and our, the speaker last month, um, I can no longer remember what the theme was, but she talked about creative process and she had a steps um, that she encourage um, creators to walk through to help them be sort of consistent and effective um, in their creativity. Um, and structure is important. Um, and so when it comes to living our values um, and embodying our strengths and, you know, being our best selves, um, our brains work against us. Um, there's uh, Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, except for he's actually a psychologist, so I love that he won the Nobel Prize for economics. Um, he created an entire theory, it's called behavioral economics, and what he, he talks about in his book that he wrote for everyone to understand, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, he talked about our brain, there's two systems, there's system one, which is fast and automatic and the reason that you can walk and talk and chew gum and think about how late you are and look at your phone all at the same time, right? And then there's system two, which is very slow and purposeful and, um, and you have to have um, intent in the way that you approach. And 99.99999% of the time we are in system one. Like we think of ourselves as these logical, rational, um, uh, uh, careful, engaging, um, ethical people. And in reality, system one is in charge all of the time. And so the only way to kind of get out of system one is to slow things down and be intentional. Um, and that's having an ethical decision-making model. Um, and then also having this idea that um, I haven't already drawn a conclusion about who I am because it's very important to all of our self images to think of ourselves as good people. And you know, uh, people in jail think that they're better than the other people that are in jail. The, the other people are real criminals. They're still a good person. They judge others, but they oh, everybody always sees themselves in the best possible light. Um, and the problem with that is that if we think we're good, then we just decide that that's how we're always going to be. But when it comes to the way that we act, it's always situational. So if you have a mindset that I'm good-ish, 
then you're open to the fact that maybe you could do something outside of your values, outside of your best self, and that you need to be mindful um, and slow things down about that. Um, and so, you know, I always ask my students the first second class, they have to do this Barrett Values Assessment. It's a free online thing that you can do. Um, and I ask them to, you know, um, find out what their values are by going through this intentional process and then to write about their values um, and to really revisit those throughout our time together in the semester. And, you know, I've thought a lot about this and, you know, there are tons of lists of values and I always start with like 30 or 40 and then you kind of pare it down and it's like, how do you get to like a smaller number? And the answer is I just cheat and decide that these words encompass a lot of different values, right? Um, and so um, community is has always been my number one. Um, and I think of community as um, a whole bunch of things wrapped into one. Um, and when I think about my actions and the way that I want to be with people, I think, does this take me closer to community or away from community? Is this action going to help me um, connect more or disconnect? Um, and so community is like, um, you know, justice and truth and not lying and integrity and all those things, right? But to me, it's like that. And then growth mindset is just always being open to that idea that I could be wrong and that I'm not always going to do the right thing, um, even if I want to, and that I just have to be open to always learning, um, always growing. So that's growth mindset. Um, and then social justice is just, uh, you know, an umbrella idea of um, all the isms and the bad things that I wish didn't exist. Um, being mindful of how we can all work to sort of make that better, right? So those are those are my values, um, and I invite you to think about. You know, you can go online. There's several um, free values assessments. The one that I have my students do is called the Barrett Values Assessment. It's through the Barrett Value Center. It's it's free, um, and you know, think to yourself, what what are my values? Have I ever sat down and thought about that and really defined what are my values? Uh, and the other thing is, um, you know, what are you good at? What gives you energy? Um, where do you find that you are most engaged and entombed um, with what you do? Um, and for me, I have found an assessment, um, and it's an instrument. Uh, you know, I, I live in this academic environment where everybody judges everyone all the time, and everybody's research is always better than someone else's research. And at the business school, um, people have all kinds of thoughts about assessments, these self-assessments, these ones that tell you um, about who you are. Um, the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator is one. There's true colors. There's, there's many, many um, different assessments. The sort of research gold standard is something called the Big Five. Um, the Clifton Strengths Instrument is based on 40 years of research. It's like it's peer assessed, um, independently reviewed, um, and validated. And it's ipsative and static, which I never know what those words mean, but they just tell me they're, they're academic words. They sound good. Um, but it's it's an assessment that I like that I've certainly bought into. I make all of my students take it. Part of that, you know, who are you? What are your values? Use and what are your talents, right? What what is it that helps you be your best self when you play to those things? Um, and when Anne said I was a consultant, the kind of I, I I'm a coach, right? I just I help people. Um, I use the Clifton Strengths as a, as a launching pad for that. I always kind of ask people to start with, you know, what are your top five talents? Um, these happen to be mine, but there are many different ways, many instruments, many different things you can use to assess yourself. Um, but for me, you know, this represents that I have a strategic talent. I have two strategic talents. I sort of lead. Input is like what makes me enjoy all those crazy little objects and putting everything together. It just makes me endlessly curious. Um, and it's why I teach like six different classes, um, three different ones in a semester. I never make anything easy. Um, developer and later, that's like, th 
those are um, uh, people relationship building talents and, and that's really where my community comes from. And developers take pride in helping other people achieve um, and seeing success in others. And so, you know, my proudest moments are when I had a hand in someone discovering something just because I, rep I, I recommended a book or asked them a question and then they reached some kind of new goal. Um, and that just gives me such satisfaction. Um, activator is what my wife calls my undiagnosed ADD. Um, activators are people who just, it's like ready, fire, aim, you know, it's like have a thought, move your feet. Um, and so I think best when I'm moving, so I'm a big challenge for Marty had to come and say, don't walk in front of the projector. I'm like, okay, I have to remember not to walk in front of the projector, but there are people over here and I want to be with people. Um, so that's a challenge, right? I'm, I'm trying. Uh, flat classrooms are a challenge because um, you want to engage with everyone, um, but I also don't want to make people dizzy. I've been told that you're kind of you're kind of all over the place, but um, and and learner just means I really I'm that that feeds my growth mindset. So you know those are my talents, um, and those are what I think about. And so whenever I have a new opportunity or a new challenge, I always think to myself, how can I use my talents to face that? Or does this play to my talents, um, or does it take me away from my talents? Right? Those are always um, my questions, my thoughts for myself. Um, but these are some really good questions for your own determination talent. You don't need to take an assessment. Um, you've been yourself your whole life, so you have a good idea of, of, of what you like and don't like. But the questions that help you identify your talent is where do you where do you feel drawn? You know, pay attention to your interest um, because your interest will always. Um, drive all of your success. When students want to go to medical school or law school and they can major in anything, but they have this very, very intense goal and they're very achievement oriented and they're like, professor, what should I major in in order to be good and get the thing that I want? And they're like, what are the admissions committee going to like the best for law school or for medical school or whatever? And I say, what do you like? What are you interested in? Because whatever you're interested in, skills always follow interest. And so when it comes to your talents, what are your yearnings, right? Where, what do you just feel drawn to? I like toys. I like gluing tiny things to wood. I don't know why. I just do. Um, rapid learning. One is it that you've walked into a situation, a new opportunity, a new scenario, and you were just there. It was like, oh my God, this is it. Um, this is what I was always meant to do, or this is what I always enjoy, or I just want to do more of this, right? When can I do this again? Always a good question. When do you lose track of time, right? That's the idea of flow. It's like you look up and an hour has gone by and you've just been drawing wonderful, beautiful things on a pad and you didn't know that time had passed, right? Um, so that's always a good clue. Um, when do you feel really satisfied with the work that you've done or what you've accomplished and you just feel like, wow, this I put myself into this and I see myself in that. Um, and then glimpses of excellence, right? When do you say, wow, Wow, this there's a sort of no limit to what I think I can achieve if I keep doing these things. Hey, Cleo. Um, and so those are kind of the five clues to where you have talent um, and what your talents are. When you experience those things, that's when um, you can kind of say, oh, yeah, that's that's a talent. Um, how many of you have a favorite unconscious bias? A few of you? Yeah, I know. It's very popular. Um, it's, it's all the rage. Um, this actually is a deck of cards that you can buy, and you can assign people um, their, uh, the bias that they need to learn about. But that system one brain thing that I was talking about, um, we all have this. We all have these biases that have been um, sort of baked into us and conditioned sort of by our society, by the way that our brain, um, you know, so our brain is always motivated to be um, efficient and effective um, and to use the least amount of energy possible. Um, and, so it, and so that can be uh, powerful, but it can also be biased, right? Um, and so I spend a semester teaching my students, they're like, I don't know, like over 100 um, identified research validated 
unconscious biases that we all have. Um, and these are three of my favorite. Um, fundamental attribution error, um, that's all about giving yourself credit um, for what you think. I am what I think, but you, David, are what you do, and I'm gonna judge the hell out of you by your actions, right? Um, and even situationally, right, even if like, you know, they've done experiments where they made people write um, in defense of Fidel Castro. And some people had to write uh, an essay in, in favor of his dictatorship. And some people were assigned to write um, against his dictatorship. It was an assignment. But and the people who read the essays knew that it was an assignment, that it wasn't necessarily reflecting um, the opinions of the people who wrote it. They were engaging in an academic academic exercise, a thought experiment, and yet when they read the essay that went against their personal viewpoint, like maybe they thought Castro was great, and so then yay, I loved that essay in support of him, or maybe they thought he was terrible, and yay, I love the essay um, against him, but whatever their viewpoint was, they judged the people who wrote the essay. Like, that's a bad person because they disagree with me. Or that's a good person because they agree with me. And yet the people weren't actually expressing their real thoughts. And it was an assignment and the people knew it and yet they still judged them. So fundamental attribution error is I am what I think. I am all of my thoughts and intentions and all of the experiences that brought me to this moment. And I will excuse myself for anything. Um, but you are what you do, right? Um, and uh, this is my beautiful wife. Um, she didn't do the dishes last night, um, and I judge her for that. That's not true. She actually did do the dishes. Um, but I judge her for that um, because it was her night, and she didn't do them, right? Tonight is my night to do the dishes, and if I don't do them, it's because I had to get up really early to get ready for this talk, and then I have all these meetings, and then, you know, uh, I haven't done anything fun this week, so I really wanna watch a show and, uh, and relax, and so I don't do the dishes, and that's okay, because I know that I'm a good person, and I meant to do the dishes, but I have all these other things, but she didn't do them last night, and that's bad, right? Fundamental attribution, attribution error is I am what I think, you are what you do. Um, and so, you know, these biases, it's important to know that they exist um, so that we can then do the next most important thing, which is have an ethical decision making model to help us get out of system one, to help us get away from our ethical, um, our, our, um, implicit bias, our unconscious bias, and be a little bit more intentional in the way that we think about things. This is a model, it's, it's just a five-step process, just an easy five-step process, right? Just memorize that and use it everywhere. I actually do have it written down. Um, and you can't do this all the time, of course you can't. Um, but there is one thing that you can always do, um, and it's called the social media test. It used to be called the Wall Street Journal test or the newspaper test. But the question you can always ask yourself is if everybody in the world that I have ever met, ever cared about, ever engaged with, finds out tomorrow what I've done today, can I justify that, right? Um, can I hold my head up high and say, I did the best that I could in the situation, um, and, uh, and what would you have done if you were me, right? Um, I'm gonna trip over this at some point. Um, anyway, so uh, have a model that helps you stay um, within uh, your values, right? Um, you have to slow things down. And then also embracing, and this is based on this researcher, Jolly, Jolly Chug out of New York University, um, this mindset, uh, having a growth mindset is very positive and also this mindset that I am a good ish person, right? Not drawing a conclusion that good is, I'm good and so everything I do is good and good plus good plus good equals good because it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So just having this idea that, oh, maybe 
a situation could change the way I think about something. And if I am a good-ish person who could do wrong and needs to be open um, to that possibility, um, then I keep my mind open, right? So um, that is an important mindset to adopt. Um, and I know you didn't sign up for an ethics lecture, but I'm sharing my ethos with you. These are things I care about. This is how I like to live, how I try to live my life, how I try to encourage my students um, to live their lives. Um, and the other thing, um, when I got promoted, I had to put my whole teaching philosophy, I had to write a, a document and put it all um, together. And so when I think about you know, my commitment um, as an educator, um, is that I think about um, my most important commitments are community involvement and selfless service. Um, and so I make my students do service projects. Like they don't know they're signing up for an academic service learning course, but as soon as they get in, I'm like, surprise, um, you get to find a community partner and work together to do something um, good for an organization that has a mission. So if you need a project, um, come see me. I'm always looking um, for projects and organization. Um, but so this is kind of my ethos, right? I had to spend a lot of time thinking about it. I had to write it down. I had to get judged by uh, 18 layers of people at the university to, to then say, okay, we'll let you cheat. We'll let you keep teaching. Um, and so, you know, my idea um, is, is I'm zealous about making courses real and relatable for students, integrating service projects, experiential learning, and popular culture into my lessons, right? That's, that's how I teach. That's how I want people to learn. That's how I think um, I can best set students up um, for success um, after leaving my classroom. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, if you can narrow it down, and if you ask me to recite this after the talk, I'm not going to be able to do it. But I did think a really long time about how to put this in to one sentence. Um, and so it's, I embrace strengths-based leadership and integrate play, experiential learning, and service into my teaching practice, right? That, that's my ethos. That's what, uh, it's not everything about me, but it's a lot about me. It's a lot of what I care about most. Um, and the other thing I care about um, is getting people to play with me. Um, so uh, on the sides um, of uh, some of your chairs, there is a clear Ziploc bag that has um, super balls in it. And so what I want all of you to do is take a ball, any ball, doesn't matter, um, take a ball and uh, pass the bag down. So everybody gets a ball. That's the, that's the big thing is um, pass it around. Um, there are no cheap seats here, so pass them in the back as well. Um, everybody just grab a ball, pass it around, um, keep passing. Uh, moving it, have you guys, got, so you guys get balls, you get balls, everybody gets balls, you got balls, people in the back get balls. It sounds, it starts to sound obscene when you say that word, it's a toy, it's a child's toy. Um, and so, yeah, the, the goal is to just uh, take a ball. Should have done that. Um, all right. Has everybody had an opportunity? Everyone has a ball. Wonderful. Okay, and so this is a little bit hard to do in the current seating arrangement, so you can improvise. But the goal um, is for you to find a friend and bounce the ball back and forth with your friend. <laughs> or if you feel more comfortable, just stand up and bounce the ball yourself. But everybody has to stand up and make the ball work. Stand up, bounce the ball, try and do it back and forth.
seats. If you can hear my voice, clap once. If you can hear my voice, clap twice. All right. So, uh, why did I make you do that? Number one, it's fun. I like watching people chase after their balls. It, it makes me laugh. Um, it gets you outside of your comfort zone and it gets you in touch with something sort of fundamental. Um, there's a great documentary called How the Ball Taught the World to Play and there's just something elemental about the ball. It's so simple and so fun. Um, and when you started bouncing it, who was afraid that their ball would not bounce back after it hit the ground? A few of you. Um, but in general, the ball does bounce, maybe not as high as you want, maybe goes in another direction, but it's still bouncing, it's still functioning. Um, and so what the ball represents um, is your resilience, right? Your ability to overcome any challenge. Uh, and so if you rely on your values and your talents um, and you trust that those will carry you through, that's what makes you resilient. Um, and that is uh, what I want you to sort of take with you. Um, Keep the ball, it's a symbol um, of your strengths and a reminder to keep playing your life. If you don't happen to like your ball, you can go up to the tables and trade, <laughs> trade out balls. I just didn't want everybody to spend time picking the perfect ball in the moment because I'm already over time. Um, and that is all I have, thank you very much. Hey Karen, thanks for sharing with us in terms of who you are. Um, I have a question about uh, this ideology that you talked about, system one and system two thinking. Can you can you talk about like personal um, tactics that you may use to like use system two more when you are in system one the most? Yeah, that's that's a very good question, and I think about that a lot um, because I have a background um, as a career director and um, bringing you know employers to campus, and because I care deeply about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and because I know about unconscious bias, and there's all sorts of research that we um, think that we're not judgmental, but then we judge clients in really bad ways, um, and we think we're the worst part is we think we're being neutral and giving everybody a fair chance, and we're a merit and really we're not. Um, and the only way to do that is to have a checklist. So um, a structure, so in an example that I use, I just hired somebody in my office and um, I'm an academic director of, of a program, which means I need real people with real skills to be doing the real work. Um, and I haven't had anybody in that role. And so I've been trying to run the program and teach. Um, and it's just me and I was like, I'm biased. I can't, I can't trust myself to make the best decision if it's just me, I'm never gonna get over my own bias. So I created a checklist and I invited a group of other people to come in um, who did related work um, to be a committee. And we all had to, we used a structured interview process. So we asked the exact same questions of every candidate and immediately um, everybody had to write up. And then like the next day we would then look at it. So anywhere that you can slow the process down and do a checklist. There's a book called The Checklist Manifesto. It has transformed operating rooms and healthcare in particular. Um, but you got to get into system two by making people stop, um, think, and act. Um, and if you don't do it in that way, then system one is in charge and implicit bias is part of the process. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Yes. I love how you are this like perfect combination of abstract, you're an attorney, you're a teacher, and then you like gluing shit together and it's playful and earthy. And I'm just wondering, were you born this way or was there like, <laughs> <laughs> or was there a moment that that you were you intentionally kind of brought this together because it seems like people tend towards one or the other uh, well so if you embrace the philosophy of um, strengths then the idea is your personality is um, it, it kind of gets set once you're 
prefrontal cortex fully stops developing. So if you take the Clifton Strengths after you're 25, probably don't need to take it again. So on some level, I would say I'm I was born that way, but there are certainly moments in my life where I chose it, right? When, when my wife and I got married and people were like, what are you going to do for center plate pieces? And they're like, what flowers do you want? And I was like, flowers die. I hate flowers. I was like, I like toys. Let's make gumball machines and put toys um, on the, the table. And that was like the first significant event in my life that's usually serious that I made not as serious. Um, and I felt really good about that. And that was empowering. And I just finished law school and I just started at a big like intellectual property law firm and I was like this lowly associate and like intimidated by everyone and overwhelmed all the time but I was like I want toys at my wedding um and so yeah so I so I think I just I I made choices that I felt good about and then I doubled down on them and then I've you know, had these things where they make me think about it and and write it and so then I've been much more intentional since then thank you I just had a question about how you think about both growth mindset and then also following what you're good at and what your passions are. Because I think sometimes they're, you know, if you just follow what you're good at and what you like, then you might not be developing some of the weaknesses on the other side. So that's a really um, interesting question that I get a lot. This idea of playing to your strengths or trying to improve on your weaknesses. And I will tell you that I just reject getting better at things. Um, I really double down on, on being better at the things that I'm already good at. Like I teach at a business school and every single person walking the halls is 8,000 times better at Excel than I will ever be. I literally failed, like I tried temping once and I took a test on Excel and I failed it. Um, and so they were like, do not hire for Excel, right? As this temp thing. And they used to try to make me get better at Excel. They take, they sent me to classes and I, cause one part of my job for like six weeks, I had to use Excel and my boss kept being like, you suck at this. You got to get better. And I was like, you know what? There are 8,000 people walking around the school that are better at Excel than me. Can't we just hire me a good little student to do <laughs> Excel for me? Um, because I'm never going to be as good as they are and I don't I'm not interested I don't care and I don't actually need to make the pivot table I just need to be able to interpret the pivot table when people ask me questions and that doesn't take as much work so I I actually don't I try to just always get better at what I'm good at and now weaknesses matter I'm not saying they don't matter but what I do is I try to partner outsource um, uh, delegate, hire, um, beg, borrow, steal other people's talents that I don't have. Um, and so uh, that's why I love community so much is, is that what I can't do, you do incredibly well. And so come along with me and let's do this together. Um, so I don't try to work on my weaknesses. I mean, things that like are going to kill me or whatever. Yeah. I, I mean, I do. I, <laughs> my wife did a like huge intervention with me like six years ago to get me to stop drinking Diet Coke. And, and I did do that um, because I like she showed me all this research and I was like, all right, fine. Um, but it took me a while. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I say double down on your strengths. And that's the whole philosophy based on this 40 years of research that the Gallup organization embraces. It's a worldview. It's, it's very antithetical to what we're taught in you know, Western society, but I don't, I don't work too much on my weaknesses. I find other people who are good at the things I'm bad at, and I say, let's play together. Karen Landold, everybody.